just as a reminder, this is, of course, for educational purposes only and not a substitute for medical advice. So welcome, Dr. Hennefar. I think Thank many you. of you know Dr. Hennefar is a medical oncologist and director of the NET program at Cedar sinai Medical Center here in LA. So we're really excited anytime we hear about <laughs> clinical trials because you know, more trials means more treatments and more options for those of us living with NET. And we like to have like more tools in the toolbox. So Dr. Hennefar, welcome and take it away. Thank you, Lisa. Hi, everyone. Kind of wish I was just hanging out today instead of giving a presentation, but I have to just make do, right? One of the things um, I wanted to do is just talk generally about peanuts and paragangliomas, just because they're very fascinating um, diseases to under to kind of dig deep. The more you the more you dig, the more you understand and learn. So they're they're really complex uh, entities. So let's talk a little bit about. What, what makes pancreatic tumors in a little tiny organ that we don't ever talk about or think about and all of a sudden can cause problems? Um, there's two types of general cancers uh, of the pancreas. One is the adenocarcinoma, and that one is what we call from the exocrine portion of the pancreas. Um, that's the most common type of pancreatic tumor, you know, 60,000 cases a year. The other one that we're concerned about today are the, from the endocrine side of the pancreas. So the pancreas has an endocrine function and an exocrine function. Now the endocrine function is really, it, it secretes hormones, a lot of hormones that we take for granted, uh, insulin, glucagon, et cetera. Um, and when you have tumors of the pancreas, a lot of times the tumors themselves will secrete these, secrete these hormones because there's are tumors of the cells that make the hormones. So how do I get this advancing? Okay. So this is one of the reasons why um, I really in, uh, enjoy taking care of neuroendocrine tumor patients is that when they have a functional syndrome, when they have a tumor that makes a substance, it really adds a, a, a complexity and you really need to kind of dig deep and understand what's going on. Um, now, a lot of different neuroendocrine tumors make hormones. So the midgut tumors, they make serotonin, and that causes what we call we think of carcinoid syndrome. Now, pancreatic tumors and stomach tumors can sometimes produce gastrin. Those are called gastrinoma, sometimes Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, named after the, those doctors. Glucagonoma, right? You can make glucagon or enteroglucagon, and you can have a glucagonoma. And a lot of times patients will have a really unusual skin rash, and that's how we'll figure it out. Um, some tumors make insulin. Insulin will make your blood sugar go down, and that's a problem. Some tumors make pancreatic polypeptide, and that can cause issues. They call them a PPOMA. I don't know if you've ever heard of that one. There's somatostatin-producing tumors, somatostatinoma, and there's VIP or uh, vasointestinal peptide-producing tumors that are called VIPomas. VIPomas are on every single board exam for GI doctors. <laughs> so they all know about VIPoma, but they might not recognize it when it comes into their clinic. But on paper, on a multiple choice question, they're good at finding, diagnosing it from the achlorhydria, actually. So one thing that's not on this list, and you can't find a lot of it, is that did you guys know that paragangliomas and pheochromocytomas are technically neuroendocrine tumors? And does anyone know what type of hormone they produce? Esther. It's cortisol, right? Metanephrine? Oh, they can, yeah, metanephrine, good, yeah. So there are tumors that you're good. You got two different syndromes. One, some tumors can um, produce cortisol, we call them Cushing's disease, yeah, absolutely. A lot of lung neuroendocrine tumors do that, occasionally pancreatic. Yep, they'll get swollen, hypertensive. But the other one you said, the metanephrine, absolutely. Catecholamines, metanephrines, norbetanephrines. It's a, it's, a, it's a syndrome that's very important. And it's so funny is that we have this whole world of neuroendocrine diseases that we all share together. But a lot of times the doctors and the patients with the pheochromocytomas, which is really an adrenal neuroendocrine tumor, it really is the same thing. They're in a different world with endocrinology. So they have their own <laughs> parallel universe. One of the reasons why I wanted to discuss this today, because I feel like we have to bring our worlds a little bit more together. All right. 
So this is another interesting issue that we don't really talk about too much is that a lot of neuroendocrine tumors can be inherited. And it's hard because a lot of us will notice that we have a family history of it, um, but no one can really explain the connection. Well, here are the, the syndromes that we do know about, that we understand, that we've described. These include MEN1, MEN2A, MEN2B, and the list goes on and on. Now, two of them, or a few of these that are very interesting for today's topic is the VHL or Van Hippel-Lindau. This is a genetic disorder that leads to the development of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Many of these other syndromes also, but VHL is important because there's a new medication that was recently approved for patients with VHL associated pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors called belzutifan. That's a mouthful, but we'll talk a little bit more about it. Other uh, syndromes that are interesting is if you look, these, when you go down familial paraganglioma one to five, familial PCC and PGL. So a lot of paragangliomas are inherited, about 35% of them, if you can believe it. The rate of inheritance for other neuroendocrine tumors, way, way, way lower. So you might notice that some of the paraganglioma patients that you meet will be on the younger side, because again, they inherited a gene defect that predisposes them to develop these tumors. Now, a lot of times paragangliomas, and Lisa knows this because she's involved in the cutting edge, they are treated in the same, but different. So it's like we do something for peanuts and then we try it in paragangliomas. It's kind of like trailing peanuts because of just the, the, its rarity, the people who treat them, even though they're biologically very similar, they're in different families. So paragangliomas a lot of times are seen by endocrinologists. They're also seen by different types of providers, surgeons a lot of times, et cetera. But very important to know that SDH, A, B, C, and D, can you see my cursor? Yeah. So SDH, B, C, and D right here, these are very important genes that lead to paragangliomas. A lot of times when you have a paraganglioma, you can actually look to see whether or not you're missing one of these genes to see if it's a high risk for having a family gene issue. So what, you know, paragangliomas, let's talk about them. So they're about 1,000 to 2,000 patients a year, not a ton, 10% um, of pheochromocytomas, and 25% of paragangliomas are considered malignant, and up to 35% are hereditary. So that's really interesting. All right. And again, the treatments are being developed. They're being better understood. We use a lot of the same ideas for the treatment of paragangliomas and pheos that we use in neuroendocrine tumors. We use gallium 68s, you can try lutathera, you can do SSA, but there's also a lot of different approaches to those tumors. Pheochromocytoma patients, because of the norepinephrine and metanephrine, they'll usually have an endocrinologist or a cardiologist manage their, their blood pressure and their pulse. Um, also, there's a lot of different surgical considerations for patients such as that. So again, they're overlapping, but not exactly in the same family. Now, peanuts, there are about 600 to 1,000 um, of advanced peanuts who progress, it says here, but there's a few thousand a year. They're mostly sporadic, about 10% are hereditary. So like we talked about, about one out of 10 patients with peanuts will have a family gene and three to four out of 10 of paragangliomas as well. Okay, and of course, most of us are very familiar with the standard treatments for, para, um, for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and I, I won't get too much into that, unless anyone has any questions. So, what, what, belzutifan is a very interesting medication. So, it blocks something called HIF2-alpha, okay? And um, let me see, I have to move by a little panel. So it, by blocking HIF2-alpha or inhibiting HIF2-alpha, it basically, what, what ends up happening in um, a lot of tumors is that they have a problem with Van Hippel-Lindau gene. That leads to 
an effect where there's a lot of proliferation. This thing over here, this cycle that you see, starts churning much quicker than it's supposed to be. HIF2-alpha kind of breaks this process. Now, patients who have a defective in Hippolindau, there are many ways to get that. One of them, you can inherit the gene, but a lot of pancreatic nerner tumors and a lot of paragangliomas have defective VHL because the tumor itself is it's defective in the tumor. So when dolzutifan was used for patients who have VHL, we found that there was a pretty good response rate in patients with pancreatic lesions, up to 65%, which is really quite high. And if you had a neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas, the response rate was 80%, which again, is pretty high uh, when you're looking at cancer trials. Now, the FDA, based on this data, approved um, bilzutifan for use in patients with VHL-associated tumors, including peanuts. So it's already approved if you have VHL and a peanut. But, and, and the side effect of this, the main one is anemia because the same, you know, the same process by which it stops the churning of that pathway I discussed. Also, one of the side effects is that it stops your blood cells from churning out also. So anemia is pretty common, although it's not usually severe. So grade three is when we consider it significant, usually not too, too much of grade three. Now, why should we use this medicine? Or what, why do we think that this medicine might help in paragangliomas and peanuts? Well, there's a lot of science, um, some of it that you know doesn't make enough sense for me to describe to you, but there's enough science there that paragangliomas and peanuts both have alterations, we call them, or mistakes in that pathway where hypoxia induces tumor growth and tumor proliferation. So it's been one of the, one of the things about cancer care that we always notice that when you look at a tumor, it looks like dead and necrotic inside. And a lot of people have thought that that is a clue that somehow this hypoxia inducible factor pathway plays an important role in the ways cancer grow and spread. Because you know, when you think about it, something that's dark and blot in the middle shouldn't really be doing well, right? That should probably stop growing and go away. If you think about it. Like, why does, it, why does that dark blob keep moving and growing? A lot of people think it's, it's hypoxia inducible factor. So you have a hypoxia, you know, this factor comes into play and there's pathways downstream that start to get stimulated. So it's been a very um, big idea in cancer care for decades. Um, so this is finally through developing this antibody to HIF2-alpha. It finally seems like we're getting somewhere with this concept. So this study is, it's an international phase two trial. So the dose is pretty much set. It's international, meaning that um, the way that it's designed is that I'm guessing that it's going to be a single arm trial that then gets sent to the different regulatory agencies for drug approval by, by the argument being, this is a rare disease. It has activity in patients who've already had treatment. We don't need to compare it to placebo. We know it's working because they're getting responses, they're doing well, and you know, probably the right thing to do is get it approved. So that, that's how these trials are designed. That's why they're international, because if you're international, you can ask each country that's participated, their associated regulatory agency. So European countries, you have enough patients in Europe that you can go to EMA. In the US, you can go to the FDA, et cetera. That's why it's being done this way. Um, there will be 70 patients per each arm are going to be accrued. I think already there's about 15 each arm. So what was really fascinating about this study was that a lot of patients with paragangliomas <laughs> started to get enrolled. Everybody thought that that would take the longest time, but that's been actually enrolling more quickly because I think the paraganglioma community also is pretty tight, like the net community. They've been talking and they're getting excited and, and getting involved. Um, so everybody gets the medicine, it's a pill, it's getting dosed daily, um, and they do scans every couple of months. Pretty traditional study design. And the objective is really to see if it's working. We call it objective response. So I think that that was all I wanted to 
to present to you, but I definitely was hoping to answer some. Oh, I saw the chat. There's a few things in the chat. Yep. Oh, someone put it on the chat. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, Dr. Hennefar, um, yeah, how does it affect the kidneys? Is this, is it something? Are there That's such something? a good question. Well, I think because it's a clinical trial, if you have stage four kidney disease, it might be tough to get on it. But I don't think it has any problems. I don't, it doesn't cause any kidney damage. So that's good. I think the only um, issue could be that when your kidneys don't work, you, epigen is your, one of the things, uh, you know, kind of like a hormone, erythropoietin that your kidneys produce to make blood. So, and, and the idea of this drug is that it makes the anemia through blocking erythropoietin. So you might have the, the anemia problem might be exasper, exacerbated a little bit. But um, I'm, I'm sure it would be not an issue once approved. But for research studies, you know, yeah, I need, I need a little more in, information, like um, we call it GFR and your creatinine to see um, glucagonoma peanut. Yeah, glucagonoma is really interesting. Oh, it's currently, sorry. And could you um, share the eligibility? I know that there, you might have had to try a different drug. Yeah, so it's, it's a little bit complicated. So for the paraganglioma, it's pretty liberal. It's not an issue. For peanuts, you've had to have had either everolimus or sutent prior. Okay, that's the easiest way to do it. And if you have any questions about eligibility, you can always shoot me an email or shoot Lisa an email and we can look at it for you and, and dig, dig, dig into it to make sure we don't want to waste anyone's time by saying, oh, you, you know, we can, we can figure that out. But that's the key one. That's the toughest one is that you've had to have had sutin or everolimus before. And nowadays with PRT and CAPTEM, not everyone's getting it. So it really depends. So it's kind of like, it's not as popular as it used to be, those two. So not everyone's been getting it. And that's been a little bit of um, a challenge. How long would they have have to have been on everolimus or sutin? Doesn't matter. As long as they've been treated with it, should be fine. Some, some people have tried it, maybe been on it a couple of days and then come off of it because they don't tolerate. So yeah, that would, that would be acceptable. Okay. Um, and what's the outlook for this drug um, in other types of net? Um, small bowel and then also renal net. I know that's kind of rare, but you mentioned it was That's a beautiful. good idea, the renal nets, huh? Those are rare. I think, I think what's going to happen, my guess is that they're going to see because the, the, the science supports paraganglioma and it supports peanuts, I think they're going in order of the science. Um, so hopefully if everybody's right and the, and the medicine works for those two groups, then definitely they're gonna open up for all nets for sure. But I think this is a trial run to see first proof of principle that this type of medication can help neuroendocrine tumor patients. Oh, thank you. This is exciting. Um, does anyone have any other questions? Any questions about this trial? Or questions about PPGLs or peanuts in general? Yes, doctor. If you are on a uh, treatment plan, does that discontinue and then you go on to the trial drug? Uh, it, yeah, for the most part unless you're on like somatostatin analog therapy, that would be okay to do concurrently, I'm pretty sure. But yeah, for the most part. Um, is or unless a it's a symptomatic, like for example, if you are on a medicine for symptom benefit, right? Like let's say hypothetically, although peanuts don't take Zermelo, but let's say you're on something like Zermelo for diarrhea, that wouldn't be an issue or an SSA to control um, hormones or symptoms, that wouldn't be a problem either. That's a good question. Is there an eligible, uh, in the eligibility criteria, does it matter what grade? W would you take grade three? No, I think grade three is okay as long as it's well differentiated. Okay, so it needs to be well differentiated in any grade. Okay, um, and a question about peanuts. <laughs> How or why do some have the possibility of changing grade from low to high grade? and any research on how or why this happens? Such a good question. Okay. So I think um, this is an important, it's tough to understand, important to understand at the same time. So the real, the real 
difference between diseases when we call them, you know, and I've been using neuroendocrine tumors a lot, but I should be saying neuroendocrine neoplasms, right? There's two main types. There's the tumor and there's the carcinoma. The carcinoma is poorly differentiated and the tumor is well differentiated. That, that is the big distinction, the big factor that you need to consider. And you need to put those two groups separate. They're really, really different diseases, even though most of the name is the same <laughs> except the last part. They're really different biologically. They're different how they happen. Everything about them is different. Then if you're within the tumor realm and you have a grade one to three, there is a difference between them, but that difference is much smaller than the difference between the well-differentiated and poorly differentiated. Now, why do tumors who are well-differentiated over time become, you know, why do they, the KI-67 notch up slowly over time? I mean, that, that's, a, that's a great question. It seems like that it depends on the tumor type you're talking about, how that works. But I think for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, they typically start to acquire more errors in the DNA. So, you know, these nets are usually typified by mutations in certain genes like MEN. And this is not your MEN. This is a tumor MEN. Um, ATRX. So there's certain genes that are mutated and that leads to a slow growing tumor. But over the years and decades, you know, the tumors continue to, you know, they're also dividing, your regular DNA is dividing and errors happen. They continue to pile up. Tumors are more likely to gain more errors than regular cells because they divide a little bit more quickly. So it's just with time and time and time, the tumors gain a little bit more speed because they gain more issues uh, and they become a little bit different over time. That process though for neuroendocrine tumors uh, as compared to most other cancers is way more prolonged. And some patients don't, some patients won't develop you know, a different grade, they won't grow more quickly and they'll kind of, the tumors will just stay the way that they are throughout their lifetime. Um, but it's a really good question and it's really important to also understand you know, how much, you know, what, what can we do in well diff grade three versus grade one? Are they so different that we need different treatments? Or are they close enough that the treatments are the same? And I think that's what we're trying to, to deal with, trying to understand better. Whether or not you treat well diff like a poorly differentiated tumor, I think most, most people will kind of agree that you, you would, you wouldn't try to do that unless you really had to. So that the grade T, grade three well diff, especially if the KI is less than 50%, you know, that's kind of like you're in the family of well diff, low grade, you try to do the same types of treatments. The other thing to, to know about KI-67 is that it probably is different depending on where you sample the tumor. So a pancreatic net with the liver met, uh, liver lesion, the KI-67 might be different from the liver lesion and the pancreas tumor. So you kind of have to like have a little bit of flexibility in your mind about what that KI-67 really means and what it, you know, and to think about the whole big picture of what's been happening. I really like how you explained all that. That's really helpful. Um, and so if you get different KI-67, you know, um, say people, someone has gotten two different biopsies, which number would you go with? I like lower numbers. I was going low. <laughs> in terms of deciding I mean, treatments and, yeah, and, and I mean, making I, those decisions. Again, I, I don't, if someone has a KI of 30 or 20, to me, that's the same. Yeah. 10, 15, that, to me, these numbers are not that important. They don't, you know, if you have a 10,000 people and we chart them out on a graph, those numbers are important. But when you're an individual patient, that number doesn't have that much meaning to you. Your doctor has to choose the right treatments, right? And whatever that number is, it, it is what it is. What, what are you going to do about it? So I, I'm not too sure that um, I don't really focus on it too much, to be honest. And it's something very interesting that we do we take for granted is that a lot of these things have are operator dependent. There's lo location dependent. If you took your the tumor and from one pathologist and you send it to another one, your KI67 is going to be different, right? doesn't mean that it's a different tumor. 
or if you biopsy it from the lymph node outside of the pancreas, or you biopsy it from the pancreas, or you biopsy it from the liver, you're going to get a different KI-67 for all three lesions. That doesn't mean that the tumors are any different, or it's the same tumor, right? So there's something you have to always consider. And what's really, really interesting is that we don't really consider the environment by which the tumor resides. So tumors really take a lot of characteristics by the organ that they live in, a lot. And a lot of times the interplay between the tumor and its environment is a lot of what you see when you do a biopsy. So it's kind of like a little bit of a battleground, a little world there. That world in the lung, much different than that world in the liver or that world in the pancreas. So you always have to consider that and to, to be a little bit, not just take the number at what it says, just put it in the context of the big picture of what's going on. Yeah, really, this is really helpful and you explain it really clearly. Um, uh, if I could ask one last question, you mentioned the tumor mutations, right? The ATX and MEN. Um, so how would people, if they were wondering if their tumors have these kind of mutations, how would they find out? Oh, this is really interesting. Yeah. So uh, we just recently did a lot of, so we've been sequencing pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors for a while. When you sequence other neuroendocrine tumors, you don't see anything usually, which is kind of like, oh, you, everyone gets kind of a little bit, I don't know, not disappointed, but you just don't see anything. So in, in the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, we do see genes that are mutated and they're always the same ones. And recently we were trying to say, okay, well, is there a pattern here? Can we tell anything about the cancer? Kind of like the KI-67 can predict, can it give you some information about what to do? We're wondering, can these genes tell you what to do? So recently we did find, um, and we, we presented it at recent meeting at ASCO, we're trying to put together a larger group for the next NANATS meeting, is the MEN1, if you, which is the, one of the most common mutation in peanuts. When you have an MEN1 mutation in the peanut, Captem works really, really well. And sometimes when you don't have the MEN1, uh, it doesn't work as well. So we're really pushing the envelope now at our group and try, I'm trying to, we've been talking about it this week, you know, which other institutions, because it's hard, not everyone's doing sequencing, trying to get, you know, a few hundred, you know, histories together of sequencing information and response to the medicine to try to see if we have a, a way to kind of sort out what treatments to give or some clues that we can use sequencing to help us. Right now, it's really hard to use sequencing to improve the care that you're getting unless you have an unusual tumor. So once in a while for neuroendocrine tumors, you will have a weird tumor that came about not from the normal ways and you could have a, an, a fusion partner. So we've seen some novel fusions lead to neuroendocrine tumors. But, you know, if you have a typical treatment course, if you have a typical tumor, you wouldn't really necessarily need to look for it. But if something seems a little bit odd, if you're, you know, very young or your tumor is not behaving like you would expect, you know, maybe it's, you know, th those are times that maybe we would do sequencing to get more information. And what do you mean by sequencing? Um, I think people think uh, of treatment sequencing. Oh, you're talking about treatment sequencing? No, I think people think uh, commonly of oh, treatment sequencing. Yeah, so yeah. can you define sequencing? I don't even know what it is myself. I just send it to a lab. So, <laughs> so when we when I say that, um, so there there are laboratories. What they do is there's um, different techniques by which they look at the DNA of the tumor. And they can tell where their, the DNA, the tumor is mutated. And they'll also look at the RNA and then they'll report that to you. And so, you know, different tumors have very um, specific mutations that occur. You know, peanut, I could tell you if a pancreas tumor is a peanut or an adenine or a PDAC, which is an adenocarcinoma, just if you give me the sequencing because it's kind of like a signature of the, of the tumor. We usually do these sequencing at commercial labs. Their names are like Foundation, Tempest, Caris. So what happens is, you know, you can go to the doctor, the doctor decides to do it. They go to their pathology office. They put a little package together of the tumor material. 
they put it in the mail, they send it to this laboratory, sometimes in Cambridge or Arizona, depending on which lab. Those labs take the tumor, they process it, they do their analysis, and they send a report back to the physician and the patient usually. And that goes into the chart. So that's kind of like the nuts and bolts of, we call it, you can call it molecular profiling. Sequencing is one of the ways you do a profile. There are other techniques, but sequencing has become kind of like slang for profiling or molecular testing. Um, so you might be here that word used. Thank you so much. I know you've given a lot of your time and I know you have a full day of clinic. We really appreciate you and all you're doing. And thank you for this educational talk. We learned so much, much more than just about the trial, right? The whole context of it all. Thank oh, you so pleasure. much. Oh, pleasure. Thanks for having me. Bye guys. Have a great day. Bye.